So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Belinsky. I'm the president of the Slovak American Society. And we'd like to welcome you to our event today, Bringing Back Bodrick, with filmmaker Robert Glavatsky. I'd kindly request everyone to mute their microphones on their, on their devices and to keep them muted through the presentation. During the presentation, feel free to use the chat function to ask questions of our presenter. After the, after the presentation, we will open up the floor for questions. Uh, as a reminder, today's presentation is being recorded and will be made available soon on our YouTube channel. However, the film we are presenting tonight will not be part of that recording. And the drawing for the chewy stuffed animal will take place following the Q&A tonight. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to remind our current members to renew their memberships for 2021 if they haven't done so already. And I want to encourage those who are attending our events for the first time to consider becoming a member. Please visit us at dcslovaks.org to learn more about our activities. In 2016, Bob Glavatsky traveled to the Tatra Mountains of Slovakia to film a short documentary about a white livestock guard dog, the Chuvach. What he found when he arrived was a traditional way of life struggling to survive in modern times. Bob is a wildlife filmmaker based in New Hampshire. He has studied wildlife filmmaking with the BBC's Natural History Unit, the makers of planet Earth at the University of the West of England. He currently runs and operates a community TV station for the town of Exeter, New Hampshire. And so with that, I'll turn the floor over to Bob. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for everyone uh, who's in the chat, especially my mom. Hey, mom. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, bringing back Bodrick and thank you to the, the Slovak American Society of Washington, D.C. for you know, putting on this, this uh, virtual event. Um, and a special thank you to the, the first Catholic Slovak Union for providing their mascot Chewy to be uh, to one lucky attendee. So be sure to stick around at the end, as, as Brian said, and for your chance to, to receive this uh, amazing prize, which I think Helen has uh, if you should hold it up. Yep. Um, so um, a little bit about me, as Brian said, you know, I, I grew up in New Hampshire, and if you guys haven't been here, it's a really rural place. Um, you know, some suburbs, some smaller. Um, in larger towns. Um, but, you know, I grew up in the woods playing every day um, by the river in a sand pit by my house. And uh, then I decided to do the go to school in the exact opposite. So I went to school outside of New York City at Iona College in New Rochelle, New York, at Westchester. And I studied um, mass communications and I wanted to um, also study history. And they had an environmental studies course there, which was religion, science, politics, economics, all about the natural world. And so I kind of, um, you know, started forming this idea of, you know, maybe combining all of them. And um, after going to school in the city, I wanted to get um, out into nature again. So during the summer when I was in college, I went and lived and worked in Yellowstone National Park. So I saw Old Faithful erupt, um, you know, a few times every single day for, for two summers. And uh, out there, I saw bears and bison and wolves and, you know, everything you could think of. And it just really um, solidified my desire to do something with, with video and nature. Um, so when I found this program in England designed by the BBC's Natural History Unit and uh, the University of the West of England, um, I jumped at the chance and I, I moved to England um, for a little over one year where we basically had three courses where we learned all the technical skills, all of you know, how to do stories. We had another course where we had to prepare for um, a production. Um, and then we just had the third part, part of our course where we went and made a film. And while I was there, we did everything from uh, sound to, um, you'll see it on the left side there, um, that's a Foley studio where they, they recreate the sound of different animals walking on stone or, or gravel and leaves and, um, you know, 40% of all of the world's um, natural history documentaries or wildlife films go through Bristol at one point or another, whether they're uh, pre-produced there, 
um, or post-production or the film crews come from there. Um, we had classes where we'd go out and pick up sticks, moss and spiders and put them in a box, bring them into the studio and, and film macro uh, photography. And uh, I spent a good number of mornings chasing these pigeons around um, the, the nice um, streets of Bristol to film birds uh, in slow motion for uh, a company that was there. So um, the, the course, as I mentioned, it was all leading up to a thesis film and what to make my film about. Um, as an American in England, I didn't know too much about you know, British wildlife and a lot of my course mates were making films about that. Um, some of my course mates were going abroad and it made me think maybe I'll go back to Yellowstone because I had spent two summers there um, and I really wanted to explore wolves and bison. Um, but I was also dating and now married to a, a Slovak um, woman named Natalia. And I had been to the Tatra Mountains several times. Um, and so I started to kind of look for stories um, in Slovakia as well, um, figuring it'd be easier to go there from England than go all the way back to the States um, and deal with the national park system back there. Um, so I stumbled upon um, on, a, on a wildlife website, this folk tale called Old Bodrick and the Wolf or Stari Bodrik a Wolf um, from the traditional folk tales uh, uh, collected by Pavel Dobshinsky who is you know, the father of Slovak folk tales and a collector of many stories. Um, so um, this is just one of the many stories about a shepherd, um, his dog and the wolf. And so what happens when old ways are abandoned to new methods um, and the folk tale starts our story. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing here and I'm going to um, bring up the film and I'll turn off my camera during the film but if you all want to listen, if you come up with questions during the film, feel free to put it into the chat. Um, and then I'll, we're gonna talk more about the film afterwards. In the mountains of Slovakia, a threat is growing in the forests. Once pushed out by persecution, predators, are returning to the Tatras, putting the livestock of shepherds at risk. To je tak, no, buď, buď zoberie, a, alebo keby som nešiel, tak zoberie, hej. Treba si uvedomiť to, že pre nich je to prirodzené a musíme my preto urobiť všetko, aby sme si ochránili to stádo. Čuvač dogs used to guard the livestock. But now these dogs are domestic pets. Ostatní čuvači je svým způsobem pořád ohrožený, ohrožené plemeno psů, protože ta populace je poměrně malá. Can the white dog of Slovak folklore still be the answer to the problem of predation? So I hope you guys enjoyed that really short film. Um, so I'm going to bring back the, the PowerPoint here. Um, so what, what I did with that, uh, I'll just go back to the, the folktale real quick. Um, I used the, the kind of movie and story technique of bookending to take that folktale and use it as the, the front and end of the film. Because I, I, when I read the folktale, and I, I suggest you guys find a copy of it that, you know, if it, if it interests you, but it really was a good metaphor for the whole, um, you know, traditions of uh, these guard dogs, of shepherding, and also of, you know, how people treat nature because Basically, this, the shepherd got a new dog and kind of put the old dog aside and said, I'm going to rely on this new thing to protect uh, my sheep. And it, it didn't go well. The dog went to sleep and a, and a sheep was taken, which you kind of see in the beginning of the movie. Um, and um, he, he no, notices his mistake and goes back to the old ways and, you know, cares for it, nurtures it and preserves it. And it ends up working out for everybody um, in the end of the folk tale. So... Um, that's kind of what you see at the end there. And I, I kind of see the, the modern shepherds, if you will, and people like Zuzana and uh, Yana Goliashova who are like preserving the dog 
um, the dog breed and that way of life. Um, they're kind of like the shepherds in the story who they turn back to those old ways and are trying to keep them going and um, keep it uh, keep it strong. So that, I really liked uh, the folk tale. And so I'm going to do an alliteration, bringing it back Bodrick. So that's always good in uh, titles, <laughs> good films. So a little more about the history. So here's, I'm going to show some photos. Um, some were included in the film, some weren't. Um, the archive film that you saw was from the Czech film archive around the 1930s, like some ethnographic films. And these photos, most of them are from the 50s and 70s, so a little bit later on. Um, and, you know, these dogs derive from, you know, white mountain dogs. It's like a group of dogs. And some say they're derived from Arctic wolves. Um, as Yana Goliashova said, they kind of came in the Wallachian colonization from kind of the Romanian Carpathians as this kind of ethnic group, the Wallachians kind of moved up the Carpathians and um, other um, colonists from, you know, Germany and Austria, Hungary, they kind of controlled the lowlands. So a lot of these shepherds moved into the highlands and kind of became um, a little more independent people living off the land there and kind of cleared some of the, the high hills to be, you know, the first alpine farmers around in the region. So here's an old old painting. I'm not sure the date of this or who the artist was, but when I was researching the film, I, I saw the dog and while it may or may not be a Chuvach, um, from speaking to Yana Goliashova, the dogs actually used to have spots and were, were mainly black, um, but they were selectively bred for the white um, fur that you see um, in the dogs today because it stood out in, at night uh, against the wolves and against, um, uh, you know, bears and in the, the field. So they could quickly identify where their dog is if, if it was barking in the middle of the night. So it's, it's interesting how the dog changed over hundreds of years. Um, but it was, it was really a part of that rich culture um, that you see in the mountains. And you can still see it today uh, if you go to some of these farms and uh, the Shalash. Uh, and, and see the the shepherds doing their work today and um, drink some junchitsa with them. But, um, you know, in the, in the far past, it was much more culture and um, very common to see the traditional dress. And here's some some uh, work that showed the Chuvach as a part of that. Um, a young Detva lad in, in his full outfit there and some shepherds milking and um, the ones you saw in the film, they, they some occasionally dress up in the traditional gear, but um, I kind of filmed them on just an average day. So they weren't, you know, nowadays they're not wearing, you know, traditional clothes every day to go out and um, do shepherding. And, and maybe even at the time of these photos, it was kind of uh, the ethnographer who was doing it kind of probably had them dress up special for that. Um, but it just really iconic, um, like sh shepherding and, and Slovakia. So here's the Krivan, uh, Krivan the, one of the peaks, uh, the Tatras there. And um, it was, you know, amazing to find these old photographs um, and just how um, prevalent shepherding was in um, the sheep trade, I guess, in Slovakia. Um, and the dogs were a big part of that. Um, and like I said, in, in these mountains, um, you know, in the very early days of it, they were kind of more independent. The people who lived near the villages and the cities, they had to pay taxes and work for, you know, the lords and that, you know, feudal society where the, the um, shepherds and stuff kind of had more free reign and protected their own um, in those mountain passes from bandits and, and things like that. So they kind of made a nice life for themselves in the mountains. And I think to some extent today, even the modern shepherds, they like that they kind of can be in, independent up there in, in, the, in the mountains um, for most of the year with their sheep. Um, but yeah, as, as um, tourism started to become more a thing and you know hiking and things like that, people saw these cute dogs um, and they decided, hey, like, Shepherd, can I bring these back and, you know, keep this cool looking dog as a pet? So it kind of started to continue on that, that path. Um, here's some more uh, traditional Odzemok, and Odzemok is from the ground, so some traditional dance um, in the Lipto region. Um, some really, really nice uh, uh, dress that they had there um, with the, the Opa sock, the big belts that they had, um, and the nice hats. Um, and just really iconic images now. I, I don't know if there's any shepherds today that still bring their sheep very high up like this. Um, and since, you know, some of these photos were taken, I, I would assume some of the forest has grown back a little bit, but um, they used to be much more in the high alpine rare areas and now they're, they're not so much. Um, some more old photos of the men showing their 
nice two batch dogs here. And in a lot of these photos, you see, you know, big family groups and everything like that. And nowadays, you know, there were maybe five people on the uh, on the farm that I went to, uh, a lot smaller groups. And as um, Dushan and Hahnemann, one of the, the second um, uh, shepherds um, uh, in the Liptow region, states in the film, there were, you know, 300 farms in just Liptow in the past, and now there's that many in, in all of Slovakia. So um, it really has, you know, dwindled down as, you know, it's not as popular as a trade anymore. Um, but yeah, the, the tourists kind of saw these dogs and brought them back. And, and also as people move from the farms back to villages or cities to find work, um, after World War II, they kind of brought these dogs and they became pets. Um, so looking at the Chubach versus the wolf, you know, they both suffered at the changing cultural norms and landscapes, you know, as shepherds became um, less of a thing, there was less of a need for the guard dogs. Um, but also wolves, you know, were, were persecuted um, until very recently. Um, as people moved into the mountains, I'm sure some of the early shepherds probably hunted them out and people hunted um, the animals. They cleared the forest for farmland, so loss of habitat and kind of forcing the wolves out and hunting them. Um, trophy hunting in the, the late 17th and, and early 18th century was a big thing in Slovakia and kind of decimated large carnivores. Um, and here, here's a shot from some, some website um, uh, with a um, young man uh, bragging about the young wolf that he shot in the Wolipto region in 2012. So, um, but things are changing in Slovakia. Um, and EU law had kind of protected large carnivores, especially wolves, um, much previously. But around 2013, they kind of got pressure from other countries and they, they started their first step and they banned hunting of wolves in. Um, 2000 kind of nature sites, protected areas, kind of a limited ban. Um, but just very recently, um, this year, um, in 2021, Slovakia passed a total ban on wolf hunts, um, as you can see from this article. And um, they, they put the value of a wolf at 3,000 euros. So it's, it's pretty high um, a, a penalty. And um, this is going to prevent another 1,800 wolves, roughly, um, from being killed annually. And that's kind of been the number around there since the, the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, so it's, it's a good thing for the wolf. Um, where, where are we today with wolves? You got, kind of got the, this is from Rewilding Europe, an organization that's trying to um, bring back wild landscapes across Europe. Um, and they're, uh, they've been reintroducing bison to a lot of areas in Romania and Poland and Slovakia, and even trying to do so in the UK. Um, but there's, you know, around 12,000 wolves in continental Europe, not including Russia. Um, and I think Slovakia had around um, 1,200 or 1,500 of those uh, wolves. Um, so here, here's some wolves um, captured in 2018 on a game camera from, not from me, but from the World Wildlife uh, Fund and uh, Slovakia organization. So, you know, they're, they're, wolves are coming back and they're protected. And now people kind of have a better understanding of it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's nice to see the wildlife kind of rebounding like this, um, as it has done in places like Yellowstone and other places where they've made an effort to kind of protect these animals. So, you know, in the past, maybe people would kind of view it as like a Chubach versus the wolf thing. You know, they're the, the wolf's trying to get the sheep and the Chubach is trying to, you know, fight the wolf. Um, and, you know, that kind of was a, a negative way to look at it. So if you kind of shift the focus a little bit with the modern lens, it's the Chuvach with the wolf and they can both kind of bring back culture and ecological balance to the mountains. So they kind of working together, um, they can kind of bring that. So um, what went into making this film? Uh, like I mentioned, we had a course that was all about, you know, the, the techniques and everything like that. Um, and we slowly um, brought it to um, a class that was really just preparing us to go and make this film. So we had kind of two months of pre-planning, doing all the research and um, coming up with a lot of stuff. Um, risk assessments, a 30-page document on where the nearest hospital was and um, what uh, foods I should stay away from, how to, you know, defend against bears if I came into one and all of this stuff that professional filmmakers have to do because it was, you know, again, for a university course. And I'll come back to the risk assessment later. Um, and we had a, just only two weeks roughly to film um, in Slovakia. So I'm mean, really quick. And then I had like three months to edit the film for my course um, and work with someone at the BBC to kind of be my mentor and help me um, through the process. 
So there, there's some my my rough outline that I didn't really stick to in the end. It went down to the wire and uh, the sticky notes on the wall had all the different topics I kind of wanted to cover. Um, and, you know, how can I organize it to tell the story best? So that was one method I used. Um, where did I do the filming? Most of it was in the north central part of Slovakia around the Tatras. Um, but we started in uh, Košice at the Košice Zoo. Um, and we filmed in Orovica, Slovakia, um, which is uh, um, up here on the, the western edge of the high Tatras there. Um, and kind of some farms around Lipkovsky Mikuláš. And, and I also um, met a drone guy there and, and went um, hiking with him up into the high Tatras, stayed at a mountain hut. And that's where you see most of the images from. Um, but we met just a lot of great people there. I, I uh, used a website called Couchsurfing and stayed with random people I never met. And um, they helped me, gave me tips and things like that um, and all of that. So that was great. And um, I even met a guy on online who did wildlife photography and uh, just messaging him on Facebook and saying like, hey, you know, would you mind helping me out? I, I met this guy in a parking lot. He spoke a little bit of English and I just went in this stranger's car and drove for an hour into the wilderness and got some amazing footage of deer and all the other stuff having never met him and, and just the, the welcoming nature of this, the Slovak people was great. And I, I couldn't have done it without all of their help. Um, so, you know, on location in the wilderness, getting close to bears, not quite. So this is more what it looked like. Um, and a lot of, you know, filmmakers, um, uh, documentary films, you don't really know how much is, you know, not really faked is the word, but um, uh, um, the, the magic of the lens, I guess, to tell the greater story. So um, to get, footage of bears and wolves in the wild would have taken, you know, more than a year of planning and tracking and being out there every day trying to, in the wilderness filming. So to get the shots, we went to the Koshitsa Zoo and they were really um, uh, nice and um, let us go in there for free. And I, I luckily, uh, my wife's aunt was uh, in the city. So she was able to be an interpreter for us with the people at the, the zoo. And um, they, they fed them uh, some fish and stuff to get them out of their, um, a uh, little den areas uh, to come out and play on camera. So this, this bear was just, just finished eating his fish. You can kind of see it there. Um, and this beautiful wolf here, um, I mean, it seems like we got really close and we did, but it was through a fence. So with the magic of the lens, the kind of fence disappeared and this wolf was, I felt kind of bad, was a little pacing back and forth in front of us, um, probably a little bored, but um, it allowed us to get most of the shots of the wolves we needed. Um, in their pen, and, and they had pretty large uh, pens compared to some zoos I've seen here, so um, it was nice, and they, they take good care of their animals there. Um, moving on, we were driving uh, out towards uh, Orovica, Slovakia, and this is, you know, just an average, typical highway rest stop in Slovakia, so imagine having amazing views like this, and um, I wonder if the people there, you know, get used to these uh, amazing views of the high Tatras here. Um, and it's lucky because in the many years I've been going uh, there often, um, it's a rainy, cloudy day and I don't get a, such a great view as this, but we lucked out when we were driving out there. Um, when we got to the farm, uh, I, I had for, uh, gone to the store and bought beer and vodka to give to the shepherds as kind of a gift for letting us stay there. So the first thing that happened is a shepherd reaches into his pocket and pulls out a dirty shot glass um, and we all take a shot of vodka um, right there on the spot. And then, you know, after we're filming, they bring over um, sheep cheese and this uh, jinshitsa drink, which is kind of an unpasteurized sheep cheese milk kind of drink. And I had mentioned that risk assessment earlier because one of the things I researched was um, how um, people who aren't from Slovakia don't have resistance to the bacteria in these drinks. Um, and so to stay away at all costs, and the first thing we do when we got to the farm is we didn't want to be rude to the shepherds and reject the, the nice offering they gave us. So we, we nibbled on the cheese and drank the drink. And uh, both me and my friend, Nick, who was my camera assistant, got very ill for two, day, <laughs> two days. Um, but um, so we, we, we stayed away from it for the rest of the trip. Um, but once you build up the resistance to it, um, it's, it's a really traditional drink to go up there and relax, talk with the shepherds and, and drink. Um, and this is the, the farm in Orovica there um, with uh, Lucia on the right there, who uh, was one of my wife's colleagues in, at university who, um, because my wife wasn't there and uh, I only speak a very limited amount of Slovak and no one in the film spoke English. 
Um, so we relied on translators to, to help us out and she studied interpreting. So it worked out great for us. Um, and I was able to get them school credit um, for helping me out with the project. Um, so I, I was just loving it, walking around and stepping in all the sheep poop and stuff, but being out there in the wilderness, um, watching these shepherds kind of just do this age old tradition. Um, even though I grew up in, you know, rural New Hampshire, it wasn't really a thing I was exposed to every day. Um, and it was just really nice to see. Um, and one day in particular will stick with me um, because it was a crazy st uh, long day. And then this really fierce thunderstorm rolled over the mountains. And just like in the, the national anthem with the lightning cracking over the Tatras, it was just like that. And we were all huddled in with the shepherds um, and some other tourists who happened to be there. And we forgot our camera lens outside in the rain and one of the shepherds brought it in. Um, and we were just, you know, telling me and Nick, like, well, let's get out of here as soon as the storm clears, let's make a break for our car. Um, and as it starts to die down a little bit, um, the woman who is the, the wife of one of the shepherds came over and um, we didn't have a translator with us that day. So um, she was talking to me, talking to me, and, and she started mimicking this. And uh, I, I instantly knew, okay, milking. And I knew I had to film that milking sequence um, out in the farm because I hadn't got it yet because I hadn't been there when they do the milking. And so I say Teraz, which is now, because it's the only thing I could say. And she's like, oh, no, Teraz, Teraz, like, yes, now. And she points to this um, uh, really scary looking guy. And we're like, I guess we follow him. And we just follow him up a path towards the woods. And we, we're coming up this hill. And when we get over the hill, um, the, the clouds were going over the Tatras clearing and the shepherds were there. And it was just beautiful. And we, we got most of the footage you saw of the shepherds there. Uh, milking and all, all of that just in one afternoon but we were cold and wet and tired um, and, and ready to to go home after it but um, not with Slovak hospitality we were so when we got back they had a fire going and um, gave us little skewers and we were they gave us some mutton to cook and we were you know eating a nice little meal and me and Nick were just like oh man this is amazing they're, they're so nice and kind and letting us warm up by the fire and you know we had our little snack and we were you know packing up our gear ready to go um, but they, they wouldn't let us leave. They, they dragged us into their house, um, put us in front of their, um, their cast iron stove, gave us hot tea and gave us a full, full dinner on top of that. So what we thought was, uh, you know, a goodbye snack was just the appetizer for the, the full meal. So it just goes to show that they, the people there are, are so kind. And, um, we spent, you know, 30 minutes to an hour kind of eating dinner with them and not being able to talk to each other miming with our hands and the little Slovak I knew laughing and, um, and, you know, it was just a, an amazing experience. Um, and I hope I can, I haven't been back to the farm yet, but I hope I can go there and um, see uh, Anton and uh, the other shepherds there. So it was just a great experience. Um, so thank you guys for um, listening to my talk. And I, I saw that there were some questions in there, but um, I'm happy to also answer some questions if you guys want to unmute yourselves and, um, uh, do it that way too. So thank you guys for listening to my talk and watching the film. So, all right, Bob. Uh, yeah, great, great presentation. Wonderful film. Uh, I guess I'll start off with first with a comment from one of our viewers, because uh, you at you did you said you weren't sure whether the the shepherds brought their sheep into the high mountain pastures, and actually someone said they do. They still do. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, where I was, I did I didn't see it myself, but. Um, you know, even though they said there's less shepherds now, um, there still are a lot. Um, and, you know, I think maybe it was the time of year that I was there, they were kind of in their lower pastures. So I know sometimes it rotates with the season. So um, nice. Um, I saw Dave, David asked, um, does the, the Czech woman um, who breed these dogs live in uh, Slovakia? Um, yes, yeah, she lives um, near uh, Preblina or um it's kind of in the Liptov region near Liptovsky Hradok, and uh, they have, uh, it's kind of hard to find her uh, ranch there. It's called the Yenin Ranch, if you search it on online. Um, and I, I believe there's several breeders of these dogs. They also have a, a kennel club in the, the U.S., I believe. Um, but she's one of the main breeders of these dogs, um, even still. Um, David also asked, well, what, what permissions do you need to make your film, towns, villages, Slovak government, shepherds? So um, 
most of the stuff we didn't need too much permission other than the, the shepherds. Um, I, I brought all of the extra documentation that my school kind of suggested I have. And um, here in the US, when you get for people to sign things, they usually give you know, your full name as a signature. But in Slovakia, I guess everybody has a stamp, which is not something I knew about until making this film where um, for official documents, businesses and even some individuals have like an actual stamp that they, you know, press on an ink pad and stamp the paper instead of signing. So uh, most of them um, had that. And um, uh, some of the footage I had to get agreements to um, show. And um, But um, there wasn't any, you know, thing with the Slovak government. I, I did have a, a, a letter from my university explaining to the authorities at the airport why I had so much camera gear <laughs> in case they, they wanted to check it all and, um, and things like that. But um, I didn't run into any issues. Um, I, I met a, a park ranger in the high Tatras who just told us to be uh, be careful of the golden eagles in the Tatras who may see the drone that the drone guy I was working with had and, and take it out uh, as a, a, a threat to their nest or something. So we tried to stay away from the cliffs. Um, what other questions? Um, Um, Helen asks, any, any plans for additional films shot in Slovakia? Um, I would love to do a film on the forests in Slovakia and um, kind of uh, a little bit of, you know, deforestation, the state of the forests and things like that. It's a very complex topic in Slovakia and often is heated in politics and um, claims of corruption and things like that. So um, when I brought up that film idea with my wife and other people, they said, don't, don't make that, uh, you'll get resistance. So um, part, part of as being an American going there and making films, I don't want to, you know, make any films that are kind of telling people what they should and shouldn't do. But um, I would love to kind of just talk about the amazing culture and help spread that to um, people in America or abroad. So um, uh, David asked, who, who, uh, who supported your film? So I, I did a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so I had some just individuals who knew me, but um, during the crowdfunding campaign, there were random strangers who um, gave me a phone call when I was living in England and said, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Slovak expat living in the UK. I love what you're doing, um, like spreading the word of um, Slovak culture abroad. So like, you know, here's a donation. Um, and it was, it was just really heartwarming and touching to have these people reach out to me and kind of spread it through their own network. So it was both people um, at home, my family, my, my mom, who's on this call. Um, and, um, you know, a, a really wide range of people just uh, supporting the project. And, um, you know, that was financially and, you know, things like that. But also my university provides staff to help me with the sound editing. Um, we were paired with the, um, the University of Bristol, which is also in the same city. Um, and they have a music composition master's course. So for their project, they had to co compare, the, uh, do a score for the films. Um, so I was paired with um, someone, uh, a composer from Taiwan, um, and she made this beautiful score. And she's actually gone on to compose um, stuff for the BBC and other things. So she's you know, had a really great, great career. So um, is there an English name for this um, breed? Um, our neighbor has two that look just like him. Um, I'm not sure if there's an English name for it. There, there's a, a Polish a Tatra Chuvat, a Tatra dog. There's a Polish Chuvach. Um, they're really similar to, you know, the French Pyrenean dogs. Um, there's, there's many breeds that there's also another Chuvach spelling with a K that I believe is, um, you know, from somewhere in the Balkans. So um, I, I don't know if there's an American name for it, um, but because um, most of those type of dogs come from Europe, I'm not sure if there's, you know, a breed from around here. Um, Chewback, they're based in South Carolina as well. I didn't know that. Um, how many years are these dogs able to work? That's a really good question. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but I believe most of them spend uh, pretty much their whole life um, on the farm. The best way it works is as a puppy, they're kind of brought and live with the sheep and kind of just grow up with flock. And that's kind of how they form that natural attachment to protect them. Um, there were a few older dogs that um, went and retired, if you will, at Yannan Ranch. Um, but every once in a while, they would just wander away and find some sheep, uh, apparently, because they just they couldn't shake the urge to protect something. So 
they, they, that was one story um yana was telling me that this old old retired dog kind of just would escape and find some sheep nearby uh, so i thought that was interesting there's an open air museum near where that is so um the for the budget um uh it was a fairly small budget as, as a student film. We got all this amazing camera equipment from our university um, for free. So that was nice. And the, the crowdfunding wasn't too much. I think it was under under $2,000 just to cover some travel expenses and um, you know some uh, the, the housing. We had to stay at hotels and um, rent a car and things like that. And um, buy, buy a decent amount of alcohol to give to shepherds as gifts. Um, as a kind of a custom, I was told to do that um, when you arrive, uh, if you're, you know, staying with these shepherds. So, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, does anyone else have any, have any questions or um, feel free to unmute and ask or you type it into the chat. I guess my film was that thorough. I answered all the possible questions you could ask. Huh? Uh well, there, there was uh, one question in the chat that uh, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, so uh, the question is, is that um, how can I get a copy of the film? Um, I, ha I have a limited number of DVDs. So maybe if you send me an email, maybe I could, I could uh, get you one. Because um, kind of the DVDs is the, on the only, um, only way you can watch it now. Because, um, well, I was able to show you in these settings and film festivals. Um, my school actually purchased the rights to my film and is packaging it in two different ways for, to, for, um, to be seen online. So uh, at a date to be determined um, in Australia and Asia, um, and hopefully worldwide eventually, there's going to be a show called um, Wild Tales, which will be kind of a compilation of these, my film and other students' films and show, show you wildlife stories from around the world. Um, and there's also something called Shorts TV International, where um, it's a collection of short um, documentaries and uh, drama films. So uh, it's available on those. So um, I'd love to give everyone a link so they can watch the film. But um, until it's released on those platforms, I have to, to have to wait for now. But if you if you sent me an email or, or got your got my contact information from uh, uh, Brian or I can put it in the chat, I can, we can maybe uh, hook you up with a DVD. Oh, and also too, uh, I, you also mentioned to me that there was a, uh, on YouTube, there was actually a, a video uh, or a fairy tale video of, of the Chubach. Yep, and I, I'll uh, copy the URL of that um, as well as the museum, which I highly recommend everyone checking out in Liptovsky Hradok if you get a chance to go to Slovakia. Um, and the museum in Liptovsky Hradok, I actually interviewed two more people for the film that weren't able to be um, involved in it just because um, I, I, uh, I filmed six hours of interview footage for a 12 minute film. <laughs> so uh, I had to cut out a lot of stuff, unfortunately, um, that I wasn't able to include. And one of them was kind of a Slovak famous shepherd called Florian um, Schwarka. Um, and he was this really old, kind gentleman who spent so long talking to us because um, he would go off on tangents about this and that. But um, he's kind of a well-known shepherd in Slovakia. And I also um, interviewed a, a young woman named Natalia who worked at um, the uh, Shepherd Museum in Lipkov, which is kind of uh, one of the museums in the Lipko region's museums. And they had such nice artifacts and kind of uh, uh, you could walk through and a lot of museums in these smaller villages and towns, they're pretty much closed all the time. But if you call them uh, or send them an email, you can kind of get a private tour because not many people come through these places. So um, uh, yeah, um, so why was your film not longer? Um, so it was already two minutes over what our uh, project was. So part of the, the course, um, we were just supposed to make a 10 minute um, film. And most of us ended up making between um, 10 and 15 minute long films. So um, the challenge was really um, to tell a story in 10 minutes um, because um, the, the course is really focused on story um, and all of that. So while I, I could have touched on many other topics, which I wish to, um, many of you guys may be wondering um, about why were the dogs on chains? And that was kind of a whole nother issue that I wanted to explore in the film because 
Um, the traditional way is to have these dogs free roaming um, in the mountains. And that's, that's sometimes what the shepherds do at nighttime. They, they will release them from the chains, but um, they're still not totally back to the old traditional ways, which would be these free ranging dogs, if you will. Um, part of it's because of tourists. Um, and all the shots you saw where the dogs were on the chains and they were barking and lunging, that was because I was close and filming them. If they weren't on the chains, I probably would have gotten bit or jumped on um, unless the shepherds were there to stop them. So um, the dogs are really protective and, and you have this, and excuse me, the motorcycles driving by, if you can hear that. Um, but in places like France um, they, and Germany and Switzerland where they have dogs like this, they have to put up signs for tourists and when you see a flock of sheep there in the mountains, you're supposed to take a wide um, you know, path around them because if you try and go into the herd, the dog's instinct is to, you know, it can't tell the difference between you and a bear, so you're a threat. Um, so that's why most of the time during the day, these dogs are on chains. And unfortunately, some shepherds kind of condition the dogs to be more aggressive, um, but there are a few organizations working with shepherds to give them puppies and raise them in the kind of traditional natural way of just letting them grow up with the sheep so they kind of naturally um, protect them but I would I would love to expand the film eventually and maybe make some some bonus features or something with all the extra footage I had um, and maybe a, a second trip to follow up with um, the shepherds where they are now but maybe a later project all right so it does um so we have time for, for a few more questions, folks. If you're, if, please post in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself. Or I guess maybe everyone is so eager to get to the drawing tonight. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I could just say, if none of you guys, I don't know if you guys have all been to Slovakia before or not, but I. I would highly recommend trying to uh, go to one of these farms and you know experience what it's like. And um, a lot of them have really nice restaurants near them in the touristy areas that you can try traditional flock food and and all of that. And um, it was just such a great experience to kind of go to some of these farms uh, that were less touristy um, and really you know felt like I was meeting real people in a real you know setting um, and not you know having something that was set up for me in a way. Um, even though I was you know setting it up for the camera, if you will, but it was really, you know, what you saw there was um, very natural and kind of what they do in their normal days. Um, got a question popping in the chat there. Hunters were keen to shoot dogs and there was no law against it. Uh, a lot of dogs are getting shot. How did, I didn't hear anything about that um, uh, in Slovakia, at least not that I heard of. Um, um, oh, we wanted to mention that Jana told us some time ago that, uh, that she would not sell her dogs anymore. Um, yeah, I think that eventually, you know, and Yana, Yana Goliashova, a lot of her dogs were, um, and something I didn't touch on, which I would have loved to, is go to some of these dog shows. So there's kind of a, a split in the, the dogs that um, uh, some are really being bred to be, compete in dog shows, and they're like prime, you know, dogs. And uh, I, I follow a lot of them on Facebook that, you know, they have the ribbons and the, their hair is perfect and pristine and all of that. But um, but yeah, there, there are some, some issues still to, to work out out there on the farm and in the wilderness though, but I, I hadn't heard anything about the hunting of the, the dogs, if you will. Um, but I know there, there's another breed of dogs, the Czechoslovak um, wolf dog, which looks just like a wolf. And um, I could see some confusion there if someone saw one of those running, running wild. So, um, but that's a, it's a very cool looking dog as well. Um, is another question, is shepherding uh, world still pretty much a man's world? Um, I, I don't know exactly. Um, there were a few women um, on one of the farms that I went to helping out, um, but it, I mean, it did seem kind of uh, the ones who were doing um, the shepherding and stuff were um, men, but the, you know, as you saw, there's a lot of women working on the science um, there to um, get these dogs bred properly and everything like that. So I think it's changing, but you know, Slovakia is a very traditional country um, in many senses. So I think that kind of stays the same for, for the time being. Um, 
yeah, so some, some good comments there about the the uh, the Vashinsky Tales um, book. So definitely uh, check out that that uh, book. I, I've yet to read other tales, so I'm I'm trying to find a, a copy in English myself. Okay. Um, looks like we've covered all the questions. Uh, so. I guess now we'll move on to the to the drawing tonight. So, um, so this is the way we're going to uh, we're going to work it. Uh, so I have so I have all the so when you registered, everyone to stay at their preference uh, about uh, here's yeah here's tonight's uh, uh, prize. So yeah, uh, when everyone registered, they stay at their preference whether they wanted to be considered for the for the uh, for the for the prize. And so I compiled all those. So I'm going to ask Bob to pick a number between uh, one and nineteen. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick Devanas for or twelve. All right. So tonight's winner is Chris Early. Woohoo! <laughs> Are you with us, Chris? Let's see here. Let me check the. Uh... Okay, it looks like Chris stepped away, but he's still with us. So we'll uh, we'll get in touch with him uh, and mail him his. Uh, the, uh, his prize. So, yeah. And looks like uh, we might have a, one or two more questions here. Yeah, um, I did see one uh, come in about the life expectancy of the dog. So um, I'm not quite sure. I think it's, you know, typical of, of kind of, um, yeah, someone else answered the question there. Um, so that they did live, you know, a bit longer. And, um, you know, some of the dogs, especially in the past, they worked them pretty good, you know, out there on the farm. And some of them kind of helped out with the herding a little bit, um, though they had some other dogs for that um uh when i was there um but yeah so the the i think the the ones that are bred as show dogs may may be a little longer just because they're um not out there in the wilderness um so um and oliver asked can i buy this toy somewhere so that that was a generously donated by the um, first slow catholic union so um, i believe it's their their mascot so maybe helen has more information on that um if you send us an email oliver um I will give you a contact email. You can ask Yednota if they have any, if they're willing to sell it. I, I don't know, but but I will give you a name and an email address. And yeah, many, many thanks to them for for donating us the cute little chew box there. I hope one day when I when I uh, have an apartment where I'm allowed to have a dog, maybe I'll get myself a chew box. No, no, not an apartment yet. Need a big yard for the chew back for sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll live here, right? And this will be my dog up in the up in the mountains when I retire. I'll go. Bob, you'll need home. a you'll need a big yard because you'll have to have a couple of sheep as well. I mean, otherwise for the sure. dog will be bored. Poor thing. That's the retirement plan. Move to Slovakia, forget English, and uh, be a shepherd. That's the plan. So come see me in you know 40, 40 years or something. I'll give you some jinchitsa. That sounds like a plan, Bob. I, I don't I don't see any flaws in it. I really don't. Yeah. <laughs> so so as that, long as all your visitors bring vodka. Exactly. I'm a little vitsa man myself. Plum plum oh. brandy is the way to go. I saw Katarina was happy about that. Um, and any other uh, last questions anybody about the dogs or the shepherds or Slovakia in general I just I just wanted to point out that they sell uh, very good sleeve of it in New Hampshire liquor stores oh really I'll have to check that yeah, out yeah it's from Bosnia it's almost as good as Slovak. Um, 
I, I brought the homemade stuff with me from uh, last yeah. time I was there. Yeah. This one is really good. We, we smuggle it to Virginia. Yeah. And she speaks with a lot of knowledge, that woman that was just talking. <laughs> Yeah, it's always it's always nice, and I, I really appreciate you know, organizations like this um, that you know bring this stuff together. Because while while I'm I guess I can sort of say I'm a Polish American, my great great grandfather or something, my mom could probably correct me, um, came from just over the border um, in Krosno, Poland, um, then Austria Hungary back in the, the early 1900s. But um, you know it, it's it's always great having been there and then coming back to you know be able to share this culture um, with other people and people who um, have that connection too. So thank you to, to Brian and Helen for uh, helping to organize this uh, talk. And, you know, I, I enjoyed sharing it all with you guys and hope you guys uh, appreciated the story. So thank you. Really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks, Bob, for giving us, giving us such a great presentation. And thanks for everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, I hope everyone has a great summer and we hope to see you again soon. So good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Ciao, Ken.